Good Good morning. I'm Johnny Cash, (laughs) according to Brian. (laughs) I didn't mean to be Johnny Cash, but (laughs) I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Hopefully it's a good thing. (laughs) Anyway, how was your week? I hope you had a blessed week. In the midst of our busy lives, hopefully we take the time out to, to seek the Lord and spend time with him because it's probably the most important thing we can do before we do anything, praying and seeking him. All right, so here we are in our continuing study of Revelation chapter 11. And the more we go, I think the more questions we have in Revelation. And today we're gonna be looking at the further events that were taking place after the sixth trumpet judgment. So we're going to start because there's a lot to cover. So I'm going to begin with verse 1. If you need a Bible, just let us know. We'll bring one to you. John, okay, let me start with verse 1. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. John was given a reed. Reeds are a cane-like plant that grows in the wetlands around the Jordan Valley in the Middle East, and it has many wonderful purposes. For example, it could be used to make paper, to write on, to record the scriptures. It was made for, it was used for baskets like Moses when he was put into the Nile River. It is a, it's used for small light skiffs or boats. And some reeds can reach up to heights of 6 to 14 feet, which are useful for thatching roofs, or as in this case, as a measuring rod. John, so John was told that this is, this is not the first time where the Lord asked for the temple to be measured. As a matter of fact, if you were to go to the book of Ezekiel, which I'm not saying you should, but the prophet Ezekiel was asked to measure the temple, which is the temple of the millennial reign in chapter 40. The measurements were so precise and extensive that it's written in three chapters. We'll revisit this when we get to, to the millennial reign. But also in the second chapter of Zechariah, a man measured Jerusalem, the city, which had to do with God's coming judgment, similar to Revelation, which is God's coming judgment upon man, and the end of the reign of man and the reign of Christ. Men can't wait for that. And you see in chapter 21, the new Jerusalem will also be measured. So why did the Lord have the temple measured? Well, I'm glad you asked. Measuring in the Old Testament speaks of ownership, protection, and preservation. When Habakkuk prophesied, he stood and measured the earth in Habakkuk 3, verse 6. The idea was that the Lord owned the earth and could do whatever he wanted with it and as he pleased. When this temple is measured, it shows that God knows every inch of it, just as he knows every inch of you, every thought, every part of you. When he formed you in the womb, he made you, he understands you better than you understand yourself. Not even man's heart is known by man himself, but God reveals our hearts to us. And he is making it known to everyone who may think otherwise that the temple belongs to them. You see, man is interesting, right? Because they believe that because they make something, they own it. Like land, I bought that land, it belongs to me. But the truth is, Psalm 24, 1 says that the earth and the Lord and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in them, belongs to the Lord. They are his, everything is his. And my house doesn't belong to me, my property doesn't belong to me, it all belongs to the Lord because he's the one who provides us with all the things that we need while we live here on this earth. When we look at what we may seem as chaos upon the world during this time of tribulation brought on by these divine judgments of the Lord, it's actually controlled chaos because he is in control. He has his sovereign hand on everything and on our lives. So when you feel like things are spiraling out of control 
and, and you feel like you're in a, in a storm and you can't weather your way through, through it, remember that the Lord is exactly where he promised, right there with you, to be your anchor, to be your guide, to remind you that he's got this and he's gonna help you get through it. Keep your eyes on him. Just like when Peter stepped out of the boat and he said to the Lord, he, he asked him, he said, Lord, if, if you command me, I will walk. Like he knew I had to get permission from him first. And the Lord said, come. And what happened when he started to look at the waves and you know, he took his eyes off of Jesus, he started to sink. But immediately it says that the Lord stretched out his hand and pulled him out of the water. And that's what he does with us. In, if you remember in the beginning of Revelation in chapter one, one of the attributes of Jesus was found in verse eight. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now that word Almighty is an interesting Greek word. It describes he who holds, rules over all things. In other words, the Lord is the one who has his hand on everything. It's important to remember that. It doesn't just mean that he's mighty. It's, it has a lot more to do than that. He is almighty. That means he has everything under control and he has everything in his hands. And we need to remember that at all times in our lives because we know that this life is gonna bring us challenges. Challenges to our faith, challenges to how we, we look at God's word, but we need to remember that he is in control and that he's there because we are in his hands. One of, the best, one of the greatest verse that the Lord used in my life when I was going through a hard time was John 3.13. I, I have it in the office on, on the wall because I always want to remember it. And it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, was from God and was returning to God. We're his. When we're done here, where do we go? We're going to be with him. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So everything that we have, God has given into our hands. And we need to be reminded of that, that I am his and I'm going to be with him. And, you know, we, we look at the things around us and we want to hold on tightly. And the Lord says, no, don't hold on tightly because this, none of this is really going to go with you. But only the things that you've done in my name are the things that are eternal. And those are the things that go before us. I always use the analogy of the pharaohs who who buried themselves in the pyramids with all their riches because they believed that they were taking all these things into the afterlife. Well, they just made it a place for the thieves to come in and steal it from them because they were still there. In chapter 11, John was asked to measure the temple of God, the altar and those who worship them. Now, if you look at this symbolically, which is something that I've been talking a lot about in Revelation, as some do, they say that this represents the church because there's verses in the Bible that says we are the temple of the Lord. And therefore, it's talking about the church, the believers. But then the problem is, how do you interpret the symbolism of the altar? What does the altar mean? Who are the worshipers and why do they have to be measured? So therefore, in context, the best answer here is to literally take it as it says it. It's a physical temple. And we have some scriptures that will support that which is what I love about the Bible, because if you're not sure of something, you dig deep enough, God will reveal to you what the answer is, so that he doesn't want you to, to believe in something that's not doctrinally correct. So first, we know that when John wrote the book of Revelation, the second temple had already been destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. The first was built by Solomon and destroyed by the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar. So now the best interpretation here is that there is still a future temple that will be built, a third temple in Jerusalem, which would, which would be the one that applies to here what John is measuring, which would align with scriptures in order to fulfill what Daniel, Jesus, and Paul said regarding the building of a future temple. Well, what do you mean? Well, I'll tell you. The second temple was destroyed, so any Jewish person who did not acknowledge Jesus as their Messiah they are still under the belief of keeping the requirements of animal sacrifices as given by God to Moses. Now, but the problem is that the animal sacrifices were only allowed to be done in the temple, could not be done outside the temple. So there's a problem here because it's been almost 2000 years since they've had a temple. And they have to not only sacrifice in the temple, 
but actually they have to specifically build it at the holies of holies. It has to be on that exact location. Now, even if the physical temple wasn't there, they could still do the sacrifices like when they did when they returned to the land and they didn't have the temple built, but they were able to sacrifice because it was at the Holy of Holies where they did all these things. But when we studied Daniel, we read how the Antichrist will make a covenant with Israel and then break his covenant within that middle of the seven-year period, that, as he describes, the week, which was seven years, bringing sacrifices and offering to an end. This Antichrist will defile the temple with the abomination of desolation. Daniel 9, 27, 12, 11, 11, 31. Don't worry about writing it down. I can give it to you later. But Jesus confirmed that the abomination of desolation, as told by the prophet Daniel, had not occurred yet when he spoke on the Olivet Discourse, when his disciples said, Jesus, what will be the signs of the end of the age? And he said... Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And he warns them of the great tribulation to come. Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16. And then Paul told us that the Antichrist will sit in the temple as God in his second letter to the Thessalonians. None of these scriptures were fulfilled with the second temple. So therefore, there has to be still a third and future temple that will be built. Until then, the understanding is that anyone who practiced Judaism was told that sacrifices, and this all depends on which sect of Judaism you speak to, would be replaced by prayers or good deeds, and worship of the temple would be replaced by the rabbis who teach in the communities. Some would say the prophecies of Daniel were fulfilled with the second temple during the rule of Antiochus Epiphanes. If you remember, we went through that when we studied it in 167 BC, when he defiled the temple by slaughtering a pig and then putting a statue of Zeus because he believed that he was a personage of, a personification of Zeus. On the altar, he put this. But in the Bible, we normally see what is referred to a double or dual fulfillment of prophecy. Now, what that means is that where the Lord does this as a way to validate his word, where prophecy has both a short-term fulfillment that we see in the near future, but eventually comes the final fulfillment of that prophecy that is giving. So there is this near fulfillment to remind and validate that these are the true prophets of God. Because if a prophet were to speak as if under authority of the Lord and that prophecy would not be fulfilled, then by law they were told to be stoned. So the Lord uses this to to also encourage his word and to show that his word will always come true. And so he gives you like a little taste of what's coming. But it also serves as a good warning or reminder that these things will happen because many people may not think that there's a tribulation period coming, even though the scriptures reminds us that it is. God validated his prophecy in regards to the Antichrist of the tribulation period who would cause the abomination of desolation by prophesizing about a type of antichrist in Daniel who would enter the temple and commit an abomination. And we know that that has happened. It's recorded in historical documents as well as Josephus, the Jewish historian. So at some point before, during the seven year period, Jerusalem will rebuild the temple in the fulfillment of these events written in scriptures. Now, Do we see, excuse me, any desire today to build a temple? Most Jews, religious or secular, are not really concerned over the building of a temple. But within the various Jewish factors, there's the Orthodox, there's the conservative, and there's the Reformed Jewish believers. They are different in their views on what building of a temple or the resuming of Old Testament sacrifices because conservatives and Reformed Jews tend not to want to resume such sacrifice even if the temple is built. They don't want to sacrifice animals. That's probably going to be difficult to do, especially with how animals seem to have more rights than people sometimes. But because they seem that they're... they, 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 They see them as antiquated and kind of like old school. You know, that that doesn't imply anymore. We live in 
different times. However, Orthodox Jews generally hold that the Messiah in the Messianic era, most or all of the Old Testament sacrifices will resume at least for a time. Since the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD, religious Jews have expressed a desire to see the building of the Jews by of the temple by in their daily prayers, praying for the establishing or the, or, the, or the building of a new, the restoration of a new temple. Now that Israel is once again a nation, it's not surprising that already exist an organization, actually two, and groups in Israel who purpose is to see that a third temple is built and that the sacrifices are resumed. And if you're not familiar among these, and you could actually visit them in Israel and see what they're doing, is the Temple Institute and the Temple Mount Faithful. The Temple Institute has been engaged in the development of actual temple ritual objects, garments, building plans suitable for immediate use in the event conditions permit construction of a new temple. They basically have everything ready to go. So when they're given the word, they say that they can build it fairly quick. I'm not sure what the time frame is, but I'm sure you also heard about the red heifers that were sent from Texas um, but in a way, the temple represents a sad point that they still don't recognize Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But God's going to use this. We know that there are going to be Jews that are going to be saved during the tribulation period. Maybe not all, but, but some, because the Lord is not done with Israel. And both of these organizations regularly petition for approval to enter the Temple Mount. And so far, because of political reasons, to avoid the antagonizing Muslims with the Dome of the Mosque, the Israeli government has not responded favorably and allowed them to do any of these things. But every year they try. Every year they try to go up to the Temple Mount and they have to be stopped and, and they really are trying to press for this temple to be built. Because the rebuilding of the temple is important to all of these religious Jews because they are still looking for Messiah. Regardless of where they stand on sacrifices, they associate rebuilding of the temple with the bringing in of the Messiah or, haste, or, to, or to hurry it up, speedily hurry it up. Like it's almost like if we do this, the Messiah will return. But the Messiah has his own timing, his perfect timing, which reminds me of some of the challenges that they faced in the building of this next temple. Because we're reminded that the Lord is really in control, just like he is in your life. You know, you pray about something, you say, Lord, I really want to do this, and, and there's a delay. But delays are good. You know, we live in a fast food world. We want something, we get it overnight, right? But we can't do that when it comes to the Lord. There's a value in waiting upon the Lord. There's a value in trusting in his timing and not what we think is the perfect timing. Because we want it now, and the Lord's like, not yet. You got to wait. You got to trust me. And we're too quick to run in and, you know, <laughs> and, and, and do it in our own strength and our own wisdom. And the Lord's like, no. But I look at this rebuilding of the temple, and it could be something that the Lord is using to, to delay it for his perfect timing. Because even in regards to this next temple, we are reminded that the Lord is in control when the temple will be constructed under whatever circumstances. The delays that are coming are mostly because of his delays. Because just as he's delayed Satan from taking control of the world, there will come a time where this will come to pass. And he will be given the ability because it's all part of God's amazing plan. The fact that the Romans destroyed the old temple to the point where the foundations of the old temple are, are hard to, to discover is, is not coincidence. The fact that the timing was perfect in regards to Israel start returning to the land, even though they were a nation on May 14th of 1967, no, I'm sorry, 1947, 48, 48, yes, thank you, didn't gain control of the Temple Mount until the Six-Day War of 1967. Everything has been delayed. And now that they have control of the Temple Mount, they could build the temple anytime they wanted to, but Israel's government will not allow it because they want to maintain peace. And the mosque would still be considered part of the court of the Gentiles. 
So when the Lord's perfect timing allows it, we will see more and more of events that will usher in the tribulation period. And for now, we just rest in his grace. And, and this is true on a personal level, right? The Lord does the same with us, where his timing is something that we need to trust in. Romans 8, 28, I'm reminded of, right? All things work to good, together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And even for those who don't realize that they will love him in the future, God is using their circumstances today to bring them to that point. And I'm sure as you look at your life, you can see God's hand in it before you were a believer and how he brought you to this point. And it's just amazing to me. Like, Lord, you, you are incredible. Now, in regards to measuring the temple, John is told not to measure the outer court. Now, the outer court is the court of the Gentiles. It surrounds the inner courts of the temple. And it was a place where only non-Jews were allowed to come in. But they were not, they were forbidden to actually go beyond that point. As a matter of fact, the inner courtyard was surrounded by railings with openings. And on the openings were posted, uh, posted signs, which are in one museum, in both Greek and Latin, warning foreigners and circum uncircumcised persons that crossing into one of the other courtyards was punishable by death. There was an incident with Paul in Acts where he was accused of bringing in a Gentile and um, you know, they wanted to kill him for that. But the Gentiles, which is a representation of the Antichrist, will have temporary control over Jerusalem when he breaks that covenant and he goes in and declares himself as God. And as the prophet states, there will be freedom from Gentile dominion at the end of the 70 years. You know, it's amazing because when we study Daniel, God had kings, that he allowed them to have kings. And, you know, the kings really, unfortunately, caused many of the Israelis to, 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 to sin, to go into idolatry. The northern kingdom was basically all bad kings. And the southern kingdom had maybe three or four good kings. But God was preserving the lineage of Jerusalem because that is where his city is. And that is where they rule and reign to Israel. And so he preserved Judah for a while, but eventually their sins, which they wouldn't repent of, had to come in judgment. And the Babylonians came and took them captive and eventually destroyed the temple and the city. And they were dispersed. The same thing happened with Rome. But the Lord revealed to Nebuchadnezzar and to Daniel this image of four kingdoms that were coming. And the last kingdom was the Roman government. And eventually, the, key, the government that's going to be this 10-nation government that the Bible talks about during the time of tribulation is kind of some, in some way, shape, or form a revived version of the Roman Empire. We're not sure exactly how, uh, how it's going to unfold. You know, there's many people that when the European Union started, they said, oh, when it reaches 10, but then it reached 20, 26. You know, then some people would say, oh, it's the Arab nations, but that didn't work out. And, you know, some said it was the United Nations. That wasn't it either. Um, eventually, all of these things will be known. And perhaps we won't even know because we won't be here. So, thank you, Lord. But, but regardless of how it works out, you know, whatever God's will is for us, remember that he has us in his hands. You know, and, and he will equip us to persevere and, and, and to go through whatever tribulation he puts, just as he allows us to go through tribulation in this life now, because what is it for? For the strengthening of our faith. Count it all joy when faced with various trials, right? Because knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, right? And basically it's like working out. The more you work out, the stronger you get. Our faith is being worked out in a spiritual gym. Yeah, let's scratch that. So... The two witnesses. <laughs> I'm not going to gym, so I'm like, I can't even say that. So here it is. You know, we, we have this picture that the Gentiles are going to basically, and, and he says this here. He says, why was he told not to measure it? For the Gentiles will trample the holy city for a period of 42 months. Now, 42 months, 2,160 days is all the same as three and a half years through the Bible. Remember when Daniel 
was written, they went under the Babylonian calendar, 360 days a year. So 360, you know, would it would be 42 months, you know, if, if you look at it from that point of view for three and a half years, or it could be three and a half years, or 1,260 days is all the same thing. It's just used interchangeably. Now, maybe there's something there worth looking into, but it doesn't matter right now. We're, we're good with just knowing that it's three and a half years. This trampling of Jerusalem by Gentiles takes place in the last half of the final seven-year period described by Daniel chapter 11, verse 26 through 27, when the Antichrist pours out his fury on the people of Israel. And the Gentiles will have temporary control of the city, as the prophecy states, but there will be freedom from Gentile dominion at the end of the seven years when, the Christ, when Christ comes and he rules and reigns. Amen. Jesus also mentioned this to his disciples as written in Luke 21, verses 23 to 24. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword, and they will be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. No other king ever sat on the throne since Babylon. Why? Because the true descendant of David, Jesus, will be the one that sits on the future throne. There will be no other king until he comes. And I will give power to my two witnesses, verse three. Wow, we got through two verses. Okay. I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days, is that number, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heavens so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy and they have power over water to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with plagues as often as they desire. I gotta tell you, that's too much power for anybody. I'm glad God doesn't give me that. That could be dangerous. What'd you say? <laughs> About the Lord? Okay. They say that in the end times, Satan, knowing that his time is drawing nearer, is like a, like a cornered animal, ready to attack, you know, desperate. But he who sits on the throne is sovereign. And during this time of great tribulation, which comes upon Israel and the world, we are reminded that God is in control. And here he does sending these two witnesses with power who will prophesy for the duration of those three and a half years or 1,260 days. Now the two witnesses introduced into Revelation are curious and there are different opinions as to who they are. Enoch, Elijah, Moses, Elijah, uh, other symbolisms of Israel and the church. Um, but again, when you look, the Bible doesn't really give their names. And it makes me wonder like, okay, Lord, but we all know who Enoch and Elijah and Moses is from your word. Why would you not just tell us? So maybe it's not them. But let's see what the Bible does say about them. In verses three to six, there are several things that we can learn. The ministry of the two witnesses here is prophetic. They are prophets. They will prophesy by which means they speak forth by divine inspirations as led by the Holy Spirit. Messages from God given to the people of that time. They also preach repentance. Well, how do we know that? Well, because repentance is important, right? Repentance is the most important thing for us, for people to understand, because if you don't realize that you are a sinner, then you're not gonna realize that you need a savior. And so repentance is important. That's symbolized by the wearing of sackcloth, which is when we humble ourselves. And, and their ministry is effective because they are given power from the Lord. Very important. And in that power, they will witness for three and a half years in spite of all the hostility and opposition of the world that they're in at that time. This is a passage from the book of Zechariah chapter four, this reference here that we says the two witnesses are described as two olive trees and two lampstands who are standing before the God of the earth. In Zechariah chapter four, there was an angel who shows him a vision and he shows them these lampstands and these two olive trees that are fe feeding olive oil directly from their branches right into a bowl 
that would lamp the fuel that lights the lampstands in the Holy of Holies or in the holy place. What does this all mean? Because the maintaining of the lamps was a a, a duty that was, it's very tedious for the high priest to trim the wicks and clean the soot and make sure to add the oil needed to the lamps whenever they would get low. And this is what our high priest does with us, Jesus. He's constantly trimming our wicks. What does that mean? He's removing anything in our life that doesn't allow his light to shine brightly. It's not our light, it's his light. And soot and bad wicks can stop light from, from really being bright and powerful and, you know, diminishing. And so he does this in our life because he wants us to shine brightly. He wants us to shine him. And the need of continuous supply of oil, well, we know what that is. That's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. We do not want to operate in our own strength whenever we are ministering for the Lord. We want it to be led of the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus modeled it for us in his ministry when he came. In this vision, Zechariah sees these self-filling lamps fed directly from the two olive trees. When Zechariah sees the vision, he tells the angel, what are these? And so the angel tells him, this is a message for Zerubbabel. He was the civic leader at the time after the dispersion, after they were coming back into the land. He was the builder of the temple. And he had kind of stopped the work and he needed to be encouraged. And so the angel says to him, This message was this. This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. We know that verse very well, don't we? All right, but let's practice it. Zechariah 4, 6. Because later in the vision, the Lord also reveals that there was another person, Joshua the high priest, who would be the high priest that was used for the reconstruction of the Jewish temple. These two men, God paired together, reveals that the Lord had raised up both Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel in the power of the Holy Spirit to to, to be able to do what God had called them to. In the same sense, these two men are, are basically a type of these two men because here they are, they are the ones that are in Revelation set will operate not by might, which means not by resources, because that word might could be many or one, or by the power of man, in short, in human ability, but that's not what the Lord wants us to do, not to operate in our human ability, but in the power that comes from Him, in the power of God, which is true for all of us in our walk. You know, we don't have to be called like these two witnesses who call out fire and shut the heavens. And, you know, in our daily lives serving the Lord, we need to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with what God has called you to, but that whatever he's called you to, that the source of your ministry should always be the Holy Spirit. In other words, it will not be by your cleverness, your ability, or your physical strength that you will accomplish the things that God wants you to do. It'll be because of what the Lord equips you with in the power of the Holy Spirit. And only on dependency on Him can we truly do what God has called us to, so that the flesh cannot boast and that God will get all the glory in all that we do. What you strive to gain, I was told many years ago, you will strive to maintain. And so you want it to be a work of the Spirit, because if it's a work of a flesh, then in the flesh you have to keep operating in it. But you want it to be from the Lord. And if you want to be a witness for the Lord, it starts with your own personal encounter with Jesus Christ, right? It's so important because it's more powerful when it's personal to us, you know, and it's not religious. And when it's personal to us, people can see that passion and that commitment and that desire. Because if we don't have that, it's like a salesman that comes to your door and he wants to sell you a product and you ask them, do you have one of these? No, not really. Or if they do, they, how's it? Oh, it's okay. <laughs> All right, thanks, buddy. Have a good day. <laughs> and not, not that we're selling the Lord, but that we are showing people for our, from our own conviction and our own lives that this is, this is real to us. You know, I grew up in a, in a neighborhood where there were many religions. 
and a lot of hypocrisy because people would tell me what they believed, but they would not live it out in their walk. And it's like, okay, so you want me to believe in something that you don't even believe in? You know, sometimes I think Christians are like Eeyore. You know, I relate a lot of things to, to, to cartoon characters, cartoon kid, what can I tell you? And, um, you know, it's like, hey, how are you? Oh, I'm doing fine. The Lord is good. <laughs> oh, bother. <laughs> are you going to serve there? No, I don't think the Lord would use me for that. You know, and it's like, okay, well, thanks. Good talking to you. I'm really encouraged. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's a shame because, you know, and I know that we can't always be bubbly and giggly either. There's going to be times where we're going through things and, you know, we're like, yeah, just going through the weeds right now. But I know the Lord's got it and I'm waiting upon him. But our testimony and our witness is very powerful because it's real to us. And sometimes it's so powerful that you think people are going to see it right away and understand and they don't. But that's okay. You know, that's one day hopefully they will experience that too and 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 live it but here in verses 5 and 6 we see the miraculous powers that were given to these two witnesses now anyone who attempts to hurt them will be destroyed by fire proceeding out of their mouths now at first i said oh maybe it's just that their their words are so powerful that they devour people with it but no it says they're pretty much <laughs> that um uh, this is this is a once a judgment of God upon their enemies and a means of protection of the two witnesses so that no one could put a hand on them. And it says that anyone who wants to harm them, he must be killed in the manner. Now, I know some people can kill you with their words, right? Because they're pretty harsh. But this is not what this is talking about. The prophet Elijah also called fire from heaven when a company, if you remember the story in 2 Kings, that 50 troops, a company of 50 troops came to him and he called out like they wanted to arrest him. Poof, gone. Another troop comes of 50 people. Poof, gone. And then finally the third one said, Elijah, we don't want to take you. And, and they appealed to him and, and he spared them. They pleaded to Elijah for their lives. In a similar way, the enemies of Moses were destroyed by consuming fire when Korah rebelled, the Levites. And fire came out of the ground and consumed them in Numbers chapter 16. But like the prophet Elijah, the two witnesses also have the power to shut up the heavens, to shut them up. And that means that it would not rain. And this is reminiscent of the judgment of God imposed on Israel in answer to Elijah's prayer, where it did not rain for three and a half years. Whoa, is that a coincidence? The same number. I don't know. I got to look into that, but I didn't want to get too sidetracked because we got a lot to cover today. But curiously, it's the same length of time as the ministry of these two witnesses in Revelation. And like Moses, they also have the power to turn water into blood and to bring plagues for the entire three and a half years. I want you to note something here that is so important, that it says not only, it is only when their ministry has been, what? Accomplished, that their enemies temporarily will have the upper hand. And this is allowed by a sovereign appointment of God. He is the Almighty. He holds all things in his hands. Did we read that verse? We did not. Okay, so let's read it. Where did we leave off? Seven. Thank you. Six. Right, so seven. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Wow, wait a minute, but these guys are powerful. All right, for now, just remember, it is only when their ministry has been accomplished that the enemies temporarily have the upper hand. Write that in your notes, it's good. It's understandable why, why, why many will say that these two are Elijah and Moses, and add the fact that in the Mount of Transfiguration, who was there when, when Jesus revealed his glory? Right, Elijah and Moses. But again, we don't know for sure. We, we can't say that it is them, but one thing we can say with absolute confidence is that they came in the likeness of Moses and Elijah. It's apparent from the powers that they were given. Now, in verse 7, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their bodies will lie in the street 
of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another. Because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. The two witnesses are killed by the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. If you remember in chapter 9, verse 11, he was described as the angel that had fallen from heaven to earth and was given the key to the bottomless pit. This is the first of 36 references in Revelation of the beast. So we know that this is Satan from what we can read in Revelation. And so great is the supposed victory over the two witnesses, and I mean supposed, if you didn't note that, by their enemies that their dead bodies are allowed to lie in the street like trophies on display in the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So based on verse 8, the ministry of these two witnesses is where? Jerusalem. Right, Because that is the city in which our Lord was crucified, even though technically he was crucified outside the city. But this is where they are martyred. But Jerusalem is called here the great city, but John calls it the holy city when he's measuring it. I see the great city as a picture of the whole world here, because the whole world is really responsible for the death of Christ. Because of our sins, he needed to die so that we may be redeemed. And that only could be done through the work of the cross. In the same manner, the whole world would be responsible for the death of these two witnesses. People across the world would be glad at their death. Verse 9 tells us that those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put in graves. Which shows how their prophecies were almost likely heard worldwide, which is possible with technology today. We can use satellites to reach even the most remote places where there is no infrastructure. And people can see what's going on in the world on a screen. The great city of Jerusalem, Psalm 48, describes as a beautiful and the joy of the whole earth city. However, Jerusalem is also a place where many evil acts have happened to God's people. Jesus himself said in Luke that, O Jerusalem of Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who we sent to her, or that are sent to her. The great city was also a name that was often applied to Babylon. Revelation 14, we will see that it is known as the headquarters of the Antichrist. It is these last days those Jewish leaderships will look to the Antichrist and they would form an allegiance with him. You know, even today Israel is interested in peace they would be willing to give up land for the sake of peace. They would be willing to do a lot of things for the sake of peace. And I believe that this Antichrist will be coming to bring peace, but it's a false sense of peace. The only true peace we can ever have is from the Lord. And if they were to look to the Lord, they would have that peace. So the holy city is controlled by the Gentiles, and the holy city is likened to Sodom, which is a picture of what? Immorality. When Jesus described the events that would surround this second coming, he said, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking, marrying, being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Luke 17. Genesis tells us that before the flood, the law saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. The people of Noah's days were totally depraved. They were not in the least concerned about what was going on or what God was doing. They were carrying on the events of their lives without a single thought of the judgments of God that they were witnessing and being a part of. We see a glimpse of that at the end of chapter 9 where it says those who did not repent, even after going through all those trumpet judgments. We read some of that spirit as well in verses 9 and 10, where these witnesses are left in the streets like the carcasses of a dead animal when you're driving along the road. And instead of doing the right thing, well, at least we won't read that there's any remorse here. Instead, we see that the people of the inhabitants of the world 
which is a fitting description, by the way, because the great city is also called Egypt. And Egypt was one of the earliest and greatest civilizations of the ancient world, but Egypt was the world. Everything you could find in the world was in Egypt. It represented all that was opposed to God. The famous wisdom of Egypt is revealed as false witness, powerless against a sovereign and mighty God, our creator. And they could not, they could not defeat the God of Israel. Even the divine Pharaoh is shown to be just a man and not a God and subject to death just like everyone else. Egypt became a symbol of oppression and slavery, which is what sin does. It keeps us bondage, it oppresses us spiritually, it makes us a slave to sin so that we can un not understand the things of the Lord or the things of the Spirit. And like us, the Lord is aware of the dangers of sin in our lives. And this is why he wants us to keep a short account of our sins because he knows the danger, he knows the hurt that it brings him and it grieves him to see us not repent from those sins because he knows what he can do to us and the ones around us. But instead of repenting to the truth, represented by these two witnesses who obviously care and love the fact that, you know, that these people need to hear this message. It's unfortunate that all they wanted to do was silence their voice, to silence their mouths from speaking. They didn't want to hear the truth. They will rejoice over the death of this and make this event like some sort of holiday. I don't even know what kind of gifts they would give to each other. We killed the prophet's gift day. I don't know, it's crazy. But this is the way the world is. They make no sense. Yeah, I don't know what kind of gift they would give each other, but hey, they were just glad. Like, man, for three and a half years, we had to hear these two guys, and now they're done. They're shut, right? In their eyes, they see these two witnesses not as witnesses of the truth, that care for their souls and love them and they have a message from a God who loves them that doesn't want to see them eternally separated from them and suffering and torment because of their denial and rebellion of their creator. But all they see them is as a thorn in the middle of their side. A thorn in the middle of the world rulers of that day and their death symbolizes the silencing of prophets who announce the doom of those who will not believe in God. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear about where I'm going. I'm the master of my own destiny. I don't need to answer to anybody. Today we see more and more animosity in the world today where they want to silence the voice of God's people. They don't want to hear about the Lord. They want to be able to take a life if they want to, to take the life of the unborn children. They don't want to hear about that that's a life. They don't want to hear about what that means to God. They don't want to hear about any of that. They want to do what they want to do. And just like in the time of the flood, here they are, making merry, celebrating. And it just shows you that this is the depravity of man. This is a world that does not want to acknowledge a creator or that they were created. This is a world that wants to silence the world, the, the voice of the Lord as spoken through his people. They, re, they rejoice because in their minds, they won against God by the destruction of these two witnesses. I always remember, and sometimes I quote this, that, that commercial for the play, your arms are too short to box with God. You can't outfight God, there's no way. And, and it's, this is what the enemy does. It makes you deceived to see that, oh look, you have a victory here. But the word of God is clear that even if you silence those who speak his word, the truth does not die, it continues. So remember that because when you're, when you're talking the truth of the Lord to people, even when you're gone, that word is still working and reminds us how important it is for us to do that. But only a few days remain before Christ comes back in power and great glory because we're getting closer and closer to the end. But there's still a lot more that's going on. So we're not always sure completely how all this timing works out. But we know that it's not over yet because as we continue to read, it says, Now after the three and a half days of the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and the enemy saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, seven thousand people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory 
to the God of heaven. The victory of the beast and the inhabitants of the earth is cut short three and a half days. So their merrymaking was kind of like, uh, this was a party pooper for them. You know, that's it. <laughs> Wait, they came back to life, we killed them. And it just shows that the Lord has power over death. Not man, the Lord. And they stand on their feet and great fear falls on those who see them. And their amazement increases as they hear a voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they watch the two witnesses ascend up into heaven. Must have been amazing for them. Disturbing, fearful. And once again, the Lord alone has power over death. And thanks to Jesus, we too have victory. Not only over death, but over Hades, over hell. The beast only offers death and hell. That's all he has. But Christ gives us life. But the Lord promises us eternal life with him. But what the Lord does here reminds me of what he did with his disciples when he ascended. If you remember, in the same way the Lord ascended and was met by clouds, and it encouraged the disciples of the victory that Jesus had over death, that that tomb was empty because he fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law. He was the suitable sacrifice. And to remind them that you will be going to heaven too one day. And if you remember the angels say, why do you keep looking up? <laughs> you can just stand there like, is he coming back? Why are you looking up? He'll come back, don't worry about it. Now go, go do what you're called to do. Which is, you know, a reminder to us like how, you know, I know we're supposed to pray about come Lord Jesus, come. But a lot of times we do that out of selfishness because we just want to end all the things that are going on in this world. But there are still souls that the Lord wants to reach. And he wants to use us to reach them. So once again, we see that the Lord does what he does here. It's a little different because it's almost like a special act of God addressed to those who don't believe in him, but those who reject him instead. That rejected his grace and his truth. And as a final warning of the supreme power of God over man, whether in life or in death. So... Apparently, it is very effective because when they see this, fear falls upon them. Because now the Lord brings judgment in an earthquake, and a tenth of the city is destroyed, causing the death of many. Again, I believe that if any of these 7,000 had the opportunity to repent, God would have given them that choice before they died, or they would have been spared if it was somewhere in the future. Because his desire is that none should perish, but that all may have everlasting life. But these events bring great fear to those who remain and is recorded that they gave glory to the God of heaven. Now that sounds great, right? Like, you know, I joke around sometimes when you meet somebody and let's say you're single and, and you go, hey, is that person a Christian? Well, when I sneeze, they say, God bless you. It's like, well, that doesn't mean they're a Christian, right? And... This phrase here is used in the Old Testament where it's used to dis 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 just to distinguish the fact that this is the true God in, in reference to all the other pagan gods. But this doesn't mean that they have come to the point where they believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. But hopefully this is the beginning of that. And then in verse 14 it says, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. <laughs> With this event, the second woe is brought to completion, and it's the final phase of the sixth trumpet. That was a pretty long trumpet. Now, the third woe contained in the seventh trumpet is announced as coming quickly. So that means that the end of the age is rapidly approaching. Then the seventh angel sounded. The seventh trumpet blows, finally sounds, and with it comes great joy as loud voices in heaven proclaim. Now the shift is from earth back to heaven. And you have the kingdoms of this world, they, they are shouting with a loud voice, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of the Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So it's interesting here, because if you didn't catch that, and you can highlight if you want, it says, have become, like, like it's already done, but it's not already done because there's still the bold judgments that are coming. But it brings an interesting point 
that even though the seven bowls still remain, how is it possible that this victory is claimed? Well, because first, Psalm 24, like I said, the earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Everything was always God's. Man never had control of anything. God allowed man to have the ability to think this, but in reality, he is the one that is sovereign over all things. And second, just as the seven, the seven trumpets were part of the six, the breaking of the, sixth seal, or the seventh seal, the seven bowls are now part of the seventh trumpet. So you have these sevens of sevens, but the breaking of the seventh seal was when the scroll was opened. So all these things are happening all at the same time, in a sense, not in the same time, but all happening with the breaking of the last seal. So it was really over, but it's not over yet. I know that sounds confusing, right? I'm trying to understand it myself. But third, whatever proceeds forth from the mouth of the Lord is accomplished. Remember that his word will always come to pass. Whether it's a thousand years from now, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's right now, whatever he says in his word, you know it's going to be fulfilled because God does never go back on anything that he promises. And that personally is big for each and every one of us because we can trust in the word of God when he tells us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, many times we're, we're, we're misled by our emotions, right? Well, I don't feel like God's with me. Well, it doesn't matter what you feel. His word says that he's there. I remember one time we were praying um, in this, when I was working for an electrician and we would gather in the morning and pray. And there was one time that we, we were there a little longer praying and when we were done, one person says, wow, did you feel the presence of the Lord here? And I like the answer that the other guy said. He goes, well, I don't know if I felt the presence of the Lord, but I know he's here. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's an awesome response because that's what his word says. With two or three are gathered, I am in their midst, right? So it reminded me, like, don't allow your feelings to get in the way of your thinking because emotions are deceiving, right? And we know that the Lord hears our prayers, so I don't think God's hearing my prayers. Well, okay, ask yourself why. Or that famous, uh, I feel guilty. Guilty is not a feeling, it's a condition. Either you're guilty or you're not. So if you're guilty, just say, I'm guilty, repent of it. But if you're feeling guilty, that doesn't mean that you are guilty, unless you are. Did that confuse you more? I love doing that. <laughs> but everything we read in the word is done because what the Lord says, he always does. And it is not a matter of if, but when. Not if, but when. Take our redemption, for example. Because of Jesus, we have victory over sin and death. And yet, though we still are here in this earth, we know that we have that victory. And we have, in a sense, already overcome because Jesus has overcome. And we have this amazing inheritance in Christ, and yet we haven't received it, but we know that we will receive it because the Lord promises that he will. So we have been given this amazing inheritance, and we haven't seen it, but we know that it's there because the Lord promised. And then after this proclamation, once again, we see the heavenly host who praise the Lord, the 24 elders who sit before the throne of God. Verse 16, and the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their face and worshiped God, saying, we give thanks, O Lord God Almighty. I love that. Are we thankful even for the, the little things? Are we thankful for the things we don't have or just the things that we do have? Perhaps the things we don't have is something to be thankful for because the Lord knows that if we got it, it wouldn't be good. <laughs> it might keep us away from him. And again, O Lord God Almighty, because we know that his hand and he rules over everything. The one who is and who was and is to come, the promise that when he left here, he says, I will not leave you as orphans, but I go and prepare a place for in my father's house, there are many rooms, right? And I go there to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may also be. We know that he's going to return. Because you have taken your great power and reigned, the nations were angry. Why were they angry? because they didn't get their way, because they wanted to rebel against God and they thought that they could defeat God or they could do, outdo him. And your wrath has come. And now the wrath of God has come. And I know that that's harsh and, and hard to understand, but his, right, his wrath is righteous. Not mine. My wrath would not be righteous. It would be probably led by emotions. But his is righteous. And 
He doesn't give anything that is not deserved. And at the time of the dead, they shall be judged, right? Which means we'll, you know, we got the judgment of all of mankind and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven. And the ark of his covenant was seen in this temple and there were lightning, noise, thunderings and earthquakes and a great hail. We'll pick this up next week, this verse, because there's a lot of things that I want to say there worth mentioning, but we don't have the time to continue with this last verse. But I do want to say this. When I was reading um, the verse that says when their testimony was finished, God allowed the two witnesses to be killed by the beast. I remember a verse that I share a lot at funeral services, especially when I know that that person is a believer, and it's in Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. His saints. Love that. We're his. I thought of this verse when I read verse 7. The two witnesses show us how the Lord can do great and wondrous works through those that are his. But we are really only the vessel which God works through, right? I mean, it's not us that manifest these powers. It's God's power through us. And when you look at the two witness and, witnesses and, and, and you look how in such troubling times they were preserved and protected, a wonderful picture of how we are too. And it's not so much about the power that God gave them with consuming fire and the ability to stop rain and to bring plagues and turn water into blood. It was about their testimony. It's about our testimony. It's about our relationship with the Lord. And that's so important because power can only be exercised only if we are first yielded to him because then he equips us to use what we use. And if we're not yielded to the Lord, that's why I said I wouldn't want this power. Not that I'm saying I'm not yielded to the Lord, but I'm saying I know that if God gives these witnesses this power is because he knows that they're going to use it righteously. But the challenge with anyone is that whom the Lord uses would be humbled by the fact that he even chose, chose to use us. It's humbling that God will allow us to be his servants. I call it privileged service. It's a privilege and an honor to serve the Lord. You know, I remember when I first started um, learning about serving, because when I, when I first got saved, I didn't know, I didn't pray about anything. I just saw a need and I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. You know, and I joke around like they would go like this, you got a pulse? Okay, you're in charge of this committee or you, you know, you're going to do this. And, and then, you know, eventually I got to learn that serving is something that we should be prayerful about because we want to make sure that that, that the Lord's in it. But I believe that because my heart was in the right place, the Lord protected me and kept me and probably sent a few extra angels to watch over me. That one's trouble. Keep an eye on him. <laughs> but it's really about our testimony, about our relationship with the Lord. And the Lord desires to use each and every one of you. But are you willing to be used is the question, Right? Because we get so distracted with this life, don't we? we? We forget. Like we're here for a purpose. We're not just here to live out our lives. We're here to serve the Lord. When we become Christians, we no longer live for ourselves. We live for Him. I have been crucified with Christ, right? And so if the answer is yes, then how is it that we serve under our conditions? Well, Lord, not Tuesday because I'm doing this. Lord, not right now because I really got to get home and cook or do this or do that or work or whatever. Or does it supersede our desires first and then he is second? So these are the questions that we ask ourselves because it's important to understand how we serve and why we serve. The conditions under which the Lord called them, their ministry was limited to 1,260 days, three and a half years. That was the perfect plan of the Lord's calling for them. Just as whatever he's called us to is our perfect plan for us. But at the end of that time, they were martyred. You know, I look at this, I look at Jesus on earth with his ministry. 30 something years and then the cross. His time was done. Perfect timing. He completed his ministry, the Lord took him home. So when I read that verse, 
again today about the Lord delights in the, in the death of the saints, I thought about how awesome it is that he is the author and the finisher of our faith, right? And he is the one that is in control of our lives. He knows the number of our days. And I think it's awesome that the Lord will not take us home until our ministry is completed here. And that's something to remember. I think about this sometimes, like even with the example of walking on the boat, walking on the water, I should say. There's a part of that story that sometimes we don't look at. Peter was able to do something miraculous, wasn't he? He was able to walk on water. How many people could say that? So, and again, that's not anything that he did, but God allowed him to. But I always thought about the other disciples on that boat. I wonder how many of them could have walked on water, but they never asked. They never tried. I don't want my life to be a, a life of guessing. Lord, did I follow you the way I should have? Did I do what you really wanted me to do? Because, you know, when he calls us home, we want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, to whatever it is that he called us to. Remember, it has nothing to do with how big of a ministry or what title God gives you. It's just titles. They mean nothing. It's the calling, our service and our obedience to God that matters. And I hope that encourages you because we are here for a limited time. I don't want to be whatever years that God gives me and I'm on my deathbed saying, Lord, I have regrets. Did I not always do what I was supposed to do? I don't want to be that way. I want to know that, like, Lord, I did my best and I believe I truly followed you and I fulfilled what you wanted me to do. Not perfectly, there were a lot of challenges, but I know that you're using all that in my life. And it's something to think about. So Father, thank you this morning again for your word.